October 17th, I'll be 100. It's exciting. I came from a Ukrainian family. They were unhappy with their situation at home, and everyone heard about the heaven across the Atlantic Ocean. That's what Dad called it. As a tight family, he admired his older brother so much and uh, loved his sister. Uh, the three of them would travel from town to town with the parents as the seams of coal would dissipate and they'd have to move on. From 1915 to 2016, John McKenna saw huge change. And when I studied his childhood, the things that he did not have are notable. He started his adult life in the coal fields around Pittsburgh and had to go into the coal mines. He always wanted to be a coal miner, just like his father and his brother. Growing up, I couldn't wait until I went to coal mines until the first day I went in the mine, and I hated it. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. It was terrible. There was no fan, no movement of air. There were methane gases and high sulfur gases. Coal miners had to work on their belly. It was all pick and shovel. I would say once a month someone was killed. In the next room, Andy Lebowski and his dad suffered a fall. The ceiling came down 600 feet of it, rock. It took us three days to find their bodies. Uh, it was heartbreaking. But working in the mine was the best thing that ever happened because the worst job I could get outside of the coal mines was wonderful. I never had a bad job since. Technology has just raced forward on his watch. He has the stories of growing up, huddling around a single radio, listening to news with his neighbors, or sharing a telephone for several families all together. My dad knew electricity was coming and he wanted to get into that. He would sit there with the English dictionary and a Ukrainian dictionary and would translate one to the other. Night after night after night, he was a hard-working guy. He set the example for my brother and me. My brother got me a book on coal carbonization. It told how chemicals were made from coal. And the person who made chemicals from coal was called a chemical engineer. And I just thought, boy, I'd rather make chemicals from coal than dig coal. He spent the rest of his life getting out of the coal mines and trying to make sure he never had to go back. He had to work very hard to you know, even get his first opportunity for you know, a, a college education. And he sees that opportunity, and he's done great things with it. I needed a job. I didn't have any money for tuition. Every night I would write two or three letters, and it took me a couple months to get the 54 letters out. The only answer I got was the 54th letter. The president of some little school in Indiana wrote me and said, yes, we will admit you, and we will find a job for you somewhere on the campus. I decided I would really like to go into teaching. Since I had some experience in industry and there was a war on, I had offers from Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio State, and all over. But Texas just stood out. I came in 46. The war was over and the veterans came. At University of Texas, we went from 6,800 to 14,000 students in one year. And they were wonderful. They'd been overseas fighting for four or five years. They had a chip on their shoulder and I wanted to learn. And I loved that kind of thing. These veterans 
it was not unusual for them to say, sir, several of us didn't get what you talked about on your lecture. Could we meet at four o'clock? Damned right. You'd have 15 or 20 that would come and they wanted to know more. In the days that I came, I could see that chemicals were coming from gas and oil. Most industry would find out that everything was made of chemicals. You're needed in every area. So things changed a hell of a lot. <laughs> John McKenna's had enormous impact in terms of the broad chemical engineering field, technically, scientifically, and public policy. President Nixon named me as chairman of the U.S. Energy Policy Commission. I said, of course, I'll do anything my president asked me. When Nixon left, Jerry Ford asked me, please continue. And then Carter wanted me to stay on, and I was with Reagan, and the Bush boys. Not only was he an outstanding researcher, an outstanding teacher, educator, and an outstanding leader of the profession, he also had the personal side. I went to UT in the fall of uh, 57. Dr. McKetta was uh, chairman of the department while I was there. It was a little scary going to his class, but that was a class I enjoyed going to the most. But you certainly didn't want to make any mistakes in front of him. If anyone nodded off or it looked like um, he was losing attention, he might throw something at you. I think I still have an indention on my forehead when Dr. McKetta threw an eraser at me. Dr. McKetta tried to make class fun and interesting. He always had a 10 minute quiz to start things off and, and Johnny had a way of uh, making you think there's got to be some sort of uh, trick question in here. I think that he really contributed to this hard work, hard fun culture of the department. No matter how much they did that shaped the world, no matter how much, you know, what they published, uh, you know, the, the intensity of the teaching, they always had a lot of fun. If you think about the petrochemical industry in Texas and the impact that chemical engineering has had on the United States, where the leaders came from, um, who they learned from, who they modeled their leadership style after, it was John McKetta. The fact that we named the school for Johnny has meant a great deal to all of us because it recognizes the impact that he had on our lives and on the lives of the students that are here right now. The key to any department and the purpose of any department. Can you imagine what that is? The student. It's so great to be able to watch the eyes of the man you're talking to and learning new things. Your students in your class are super special kids and they deserve to have a high respect from you they're my kids, and it's your family.